Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Catherine Granfield, who's an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering and the School of Biomedical Engineering here at McMaster. She holds the Canada Research Chair in Microscopy of Biomaterials and Biointerfaces. She received her BEng and her MASc in Material Science and Engineering from McMaster and her PhD in Engineering Sciences from Uppsala University in Sweden. She completed a postdoc in the Department of Preventative and Restorative Dental Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. She's a recipient of several awards, including uh, in 2017, the Petro-Canada Young Innovator Award, in 2018, the Early Researcher Award from the Ontario Ministry of Research, Science and Innovation, and in 2019, McMaster uh, Faculty of Engineering Teaching Excellence Award. She's currently the president of the Microscopy Society of Canada, and we really look forward to hearing about her research here today. So thanks so much. Great, thanks so much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak today. I'm really excited to share my work with the BIMR community. It's been uh, several years now since I've started my lab at McMaster and uh, it's uh, an honor to be able to present to this uh, group of, of colleagues and, and friends at the university. Uh, so today I'll be sharing with you the work we've been doing in my lab on multidimensional microscopy uh, to probe osseointegration and biomineralization events. And as many of you know, we are really fortunate to have fantastic uh, characterization facilities at McMaster and in the Brockhouse Institute and the Canadian Centre for Electron Microscopy. So what you'll see throughout my talk is this really strong theme of characterization techniques to probe materials along uh, multiple length scales. And we focused the work in, in my team into one particular area of biomaterials, and these are biomaterials that are bone interfacing. Uh, so part of my lab develops new biomaterials and uh, the rest of the lab is studying biointerfaces and biomineralization. So today you'll see uh, a mixture of the two of these uh, where I'm sharing with you strategies and techniques we've developed using electron and multi-scale microscopy techniques to probe different uh, biomaterials and biomineralization processes. Uh, I'm excited to present next month at the BIMR Future Directions of Advanced Materials Workshop, and there I'll be sharing uh, with everyone the type of work we're doing in the development of biomaterials, including uh, the development of materials with uh, additive manufacturing. So be sure to join in, in just one month from now. Okay, well, I mentioned we're, we're doing bone research, but why? I think many of you are familiar with uh, what bone is. At least you know that your body is made up of bones and that's what enables you to walk around. But we're really interested in studying this for a number of reasons. And I thought I'd give you some of those uh, to put the work in, in context. And so about one in five of you, particularly women who are over the age of 50 are going to be affected by osteoporosis in, in their lifetime. So this is a huge number of people in our population. And this bone disease can lead to things such as spinal fractures. So in the US alone, about 1.5 million fractures are a result of osteoporosis annually. Other reasons why bone research is important. In fact, dental implants are placed inside bone. There's about 1 million of these placed every year in the US, but only 95% success rate. So it's still a considerable number that are failing. And if we look at other joint replacements, uh, things such as hip and knee replacements, these are on the rise. Uh, about 400% increase is expected by 2040. So there's a big demand for us to understand the structure of bone so that we can develop new treatments and uh, techniques for improving um, surgical outcomes, for example, for hip and joint replacements and, and dental implants. But this doesn't even include some other diseases, cancer, hyperglycemia and diabetes, which affects bone and other rare bone diseases. So I don't think I can emphasize enough that it's important for us to understand the structure of bone and the way it interacts with biomaterials. And I think bone as a material, since we're in presenting for the Brockhouse Institute for Materials Research, is one of the most fascinating materials. And this is because it's a quite complex and hierarchical material. So at the macro scale, bone has a dense cortical shell and a spongy interior. But if we zoom inside this structure, we have detailed organization at all length scales. So at the micrometer scale, we have these structures that are called osteons, which provide a canal through the center for blood vessels and nutrients to flow. 
inside of these osteons, which are made up of circular layers of bone, we have cell networks that are interdispersed throughout the entire structure. And these cells give all the signaling um, signals to the bone to tell it what to do, how to respond to forces and other stimuli. And as we zoom down towards the nanoscale, we start to find clusters of mineral and we have collagen fibrils, as well as hydroxyapatite crystals at the very smallest length scale. So our bone is really a complex um, composite material made up of a polymer, collagen, and a ceramic hydroxyapatite. And we're interested in looking at the interplay between those components at the smallest length scale and up towards uh, the micrometer scale. And in order to do that in our lab, we employ many characterization tools. And so many of the tools you'll see in the talk today are outlined on this slide here, um, featuring some of the instruments at the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy. So at the smallest length scales, I'll show you some things we're doing with atom probe tomography to probe bone structure. And as we work up in length scale towards the micrometer scale, we're working with transmission electron microscopy, focused ion beam microscopy, and then also some micro CT that you'll see in, in today's talk. So let's get into what we'll talk about today. Um, I've picked out just three of the studies we've done in my lab over the past few years to highlight for you. And the first one is looking at bone implant interfaces. And here we're really interested in studying the nanostructure of the bone implant interface, coming up with strategies to characterize this and determining what in fact is the structure of bone at the implant interface. The second topic I want to share will be about bone ultrastructure. So taking a look at the arrangement of collagen and, and mineral, these two components that make up bone. And then the last uh, topic that I'll share will be taking a look at bone on the mesoscale, a little bit of a larger length scales, but still maintaining high resolution. And we'll be taking a look at what the bone structure uh, looks like at that length scale. So let's start with the first topics. Our question was really, what is the nanostructure of the bone implant interface? And we published this work over the last few years with collaborators here at McMaster in the BIMR and with collaborators in France and, uh, and Sweden as well. And when we talk about looking at bone implant interfaces, a dental implant is one example of bone implant interface we could be studying. And we are interested in studying something called osseointegration. And this is really the contact between the implant material and the bone. Uh, the historical definition of this is just a direct contact or bone bonding between the bone and implant. Uh, and this was always at the light microscopy level, so a really uh, large length scale. So we want to look at this interface and see what's going on. For those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the process that happens in the body, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of biology today, not too much, I promise. Um, so if we're placing a dental implant in the bone, the first step is creating this, this hole inside the bone in which we place the dental implant. It's then surrounded by a number of blood vessels and proteins and cells begin migrating towards the uh, implant interface. And once they reach the implant interface, they begin depositing a layer on the surface and uh, start forming bone um, moving out from the implant interface. So what we're really interested in looking at in my team is this exact zone right at the uh, attachment between the two materials and finding out what is it that's joining these materials together and what effect does nanostructuring or other changes to the implant surface have on the attachment of bone. And we're really asking the question, what level does osseointegration occur on? Can we find out if there's a nanoscale level of osseointegration or is this just a larger length scale phenomenon? So there's many things that uh, part are really quite important for osseointegration, many biological factors, which I won't get into too much today. So of course, we have proteins that are involved. We have proteins that deposit at the surface of an implant, for example, osteoplontin. We have cells that play a major role in the formation of bone near an implant interface, and also vasculature. We need a blood supply and nutrients for our cells. So I won't talk about these too much today, but I did want to highlight that there's complex biological factors, of course, at the interface. What I want to show you instead is the structure of bone as a material at the interface and what we've learned about that. 
Well, let's take a look at standard approaches for assessing this. So if you went to your dental clinician and you had a, an implant placed and they wanted to identify if it was healing properly at the micro scale, they would perform something such as radiography or an x-ray. In the lab, we can do other techniques. So the most common that's done is histology. So this is an optical microscopy technique where we have this implant material in black here. And inside we can see this stained bone tissue and we'd make measurements about the amount of bone uh, in contact with the implant to determine its success. If we want to move towards smaller length scales, we need to move away from uh, light microscopy towards electron microscopy. And so this is an example of an implant inside bone tissue studied with scanning electron microscopy. And then, of course, even further and to higher resolutions, we can use TM where we have the implant here and bone structure shown uh, below it. But all of these have one major drawback and that's that they're two-dimensional imaging techniques. And we know that bone is a really complex three-dimensional structure. So we want to be able to use three-dimensional microscopy techniques to probe its structure. And this has been done uh, quite frequently with different techniques uh, at similar length scales, but now in 3D. So an X-ray radiograph, we can take many of these over different angles and turn this into X-ray tomography, where we can see implants inside the bone structure and be able to see that dense cortical shell and the interior trabecular structure and the zone attached with the implant. Focused ion beam has been shown a few years ago to be something that can be done to probe the implant interface. And then at smaller length scales, electron tomography, so now performed in a transmission electron microscope, um, we can look at the structure of bone and, and implants. And so we're really excited with these three-dimensional techniques, but in my group, we thought one of the things that's lacking from all of these is chemical information. So we've worked over the last few years on strategies to create four-dimensional imaging techniques where we combine the 3D XYZ structural information with chemical information. And so I'll share with you today two ways in which we're doing that in our lab. One, using electron energy loss spectroscopy, um, in the form of tomography. And you would have heard a few weeks ago from Jean-Luigi Baton, an excellent talk on eel spectroscopy. So everyone should be experts on that by now. And the second area that we use, uh, our, that we're, we're looking towards doing four-dimensional imaging is using atom probe tomography, or you'll see this acronym APT. So I'll share with you these two areas. So which implant are we looking at? Well, we're looking at an implant that's from a company uh, called Integrum, which is used in dental implants, but also in these bone anchored prosthetic devices. It has a really unique nanostructure on the thread valleys. And this nanostructure is created by laser machining and the laser modification creates this topography that has shown to improve the biomechanical stability of the implant. So we're really curious what it is about this nanoscale structure that's improved the implant integration. So we'll focus our studies at looking at how bone interacts with this really rough nano oxide layer on the surface. So in order to be able to visualize a nano oxide layer in contact with bone, we really need high resolution imaging techniques. And one of the challenges that we're first faced with is preparing a sample to look at this. So we're using a microscope within um, our workflow to prepare samples and we're using focused ion beam microscopy to make our lift outs for transmission electron microscopy. So we'd identify, for example, an implant inside bone structure, and then we'd use this technique to mill out and pluck out a precise interface between the bone and the implant, which we can then take to the transmission electron microscope. In the TEM, we can take images, we can do elemental analysis in 2D, and an example of an implant and bone interface in the TEM is shown here. We have our titanium implant, and I mentioned we had this nanoscale oxide layer on the surface, and above that we have our human bone structure. And we can see this unique banding structure um, in this image, and this is what uh, is made up from something called collagen banding. So the layout of collagen within bone creates this banding pattern. So we can see this representation, these orange tubes are representing collagen fibrils that are spaced out at discrete spacings, creating this banding pattern in all of our images. 
So if we're looking at the bone implant structure in 2D, we don't have very good clarity at what's happening at the interface because this is a, a projection based technique. So even though we have extremely thin samples, all of the information is being collapsed in a projection and we have quite a bit of overlap in our images. Um, so what we're doing is performing electron tomography. So we're tilting the sample to as many angles as we can inside the microscope. And that enables us to then create a 3D reconstruction. So when we do that with our bone implant interfaces, we have this titanium implant at the bottom, we can clearly see you know, the shape and the features of the oxide layer and how the bone structure integrates with this. And we can see the collagen fibrils and how they're laid out along the implant interface. So now we've moved from 2D to 3D, but I know I told you that we wanted to move to 4D. So in order to move to 4D, we actually have to change the geometry of our, our sample. And so we're switching our samples to be cylindrical samples so that we can collect information um, over the whole entire range. Um, and, and instead of having this missing wedge of information where we can't tilt our sample in the microscope. So we're going to do something called on-axis tomography. We make a cylindrical sample instead of a rectangular sample, like I showed previously made in the FIB. We make these cylindrical samples in the FIB in a similar way. We find the area we're interested, we lift it out, and instead of milling in a rectangle, we mill in an annular fashion and create a sharp sample that we can then place inside of the microscope. And so now we're able to do four-dimensional imaging in the microscope. We start with some three-dimensional imaging. So we would have our bone implant interface, our bone on the bottom, our implant here. And this should be a video that will play, hopefully, um, where we can see a, our bone structure in contact with our implant, and this time in a cylindrical sample. And now instead of just imaging at all of these angles that we rotate to in the microscope, now at every angle we take an eels spectrum image. And so we're not just collecting an image, we're collecting elemental information. This enables us to create images that are representative of the elements in our material. So for example, we have our carbon, which represents our collagen fibrils. We can separate out calcium, which represents bone tissue, titanium for the implant, and, uh, and so forth. Um, and if we take then all of these uh, spectrum images, which we've collected over a large number of angles, we combine them together using the same reconstruction principles we use for images, we can create a three-dimensional structure of our bone implant interface. And uh, hopefully if this video plays, what you'll be able to see is that we can isolate now in 3D where our collagen fibrils are. So we can see this clearly in the images over here and where our hydroxyapatite is represented by this calcium signal as well. So now we have a way that we can look at not just the chemistry, but, or, or sorry, not just the structure, but also the chemistry. And because we have this reconstructed volume in three dimensions, we now have a, a structure that we can play with. So we can slice through this volume at any place. And what we've done here is shown a central slice through our reconstructed maps. And we're showing where we have our calcium signal. We're showing our titanium implant at the bottom here. And in the middle, we have our titanium dioxide interfacial layer. And when we're far away from the bone implant, we can see our collagen fibrils quite clearly. But we've noticed that at the implant interface, we have a zone that's still rich in calcium, but it's an afibrillar zone. And so we really wanted to probe this zone in more detail and find out what's happening here. We know that there's some calcium present, but uh, what's the exact relationship between the calcium and the titanium at the implant interface? So in order to do this, we need to employ an even higher resolution imaging technique, and that's the atom probe tomography um, microscope. And this is the, uh, the LEAP 4000 that we have at the CCEM. And this technique works by having the same sharp sample that, that I showed previously, but now we apply a laser pulse to the tip to induce field evaporation. Ions fly to a time of flight uh, detector that's position sensitive. And so by measuring the time it takes for the ions to hit the detector and their mass to charge ratio, we can create then a three-dimensional representation of all of the atoms in the sample. So this is what we're trying to achieve with, with our bone samples and our bone implant samples. So when you perform this experiment, 
I think if you saw the talk last week um, on TOF SIMS, we have quite similar types of data that you would see, um, same, same type of mass spectrometry that we're showing here. And this is the, the type of spectrum we would see if we're looking at a bone sample. So we have a large number of peaks that we then uh, identify their chemical structure, and we can create a reconstruction in 3D um, based on not just the location, but the exact atom species. So when we apply this to the same sample, I should mention we've done this on the exact same sample. We've done first electron tomography to look at structure. We've done eels tomography uh, to look at the chemical um, components over a large range. And then at this very tiny implant interface, we've done atom probe tomography. And this structure here shows us the results from that atom probe tomography. We have a titanium implant at the bottom we can see our calcium and carbon from our bone, our hydroxyapatite and our mineral. And at the interface between the two, we see our titanium oxide layer, which we were expecting. Um, but what was really interesting is we also noted that there is a, a nitride layer uh, underneath the oxide layer on the implant surface. Um, we were lucky to be able to work with Adam Hitchcock uh, to do some complementary studies at the light source uh, using Stixum. And the studies that he did on similar implant and bone samples also confirmed for us that we had this nitrogen rich layer uh, underneath the oxide layer at the implant interface. So that was an interesting finding we found about the, the way this commercial implant is produced that the laser modification um, caused a nitrogen and, uh, and then an oxygen enrichment on the implant surface. So if we performed more atom probe tomography, we can also do interesting things because we have a four-dimensional point cloud. So we can now explore in different directions, compositions, and profiles. So if we take, for an example, a profile across the bone implant interface and plot that, that's what we see down here. And we can see the intermixing of the titanium oxide layer with the calcium signal um, from the bone matrix. And we can really see that we have this atomic continuum at the interface, that there's a strong intermixing of the bone mineral inside of the titanium dioxide um, surface layer. And we can also measure things like trace elements like sodium, which are really hard for us to detect um, by other imaging or spectroscopy techniques. We also did some complementary um, eels to look at what this material could be at the implant interface, so far away from the implant zone, and then looking right at the oxide layer, the bone just outside of the oxide layer, and uh, doing some near edge structure, we were able to see that there's a possible difference in the type of mineral with hydroxyapatite being the crystalline phase of mineral far away from the implant interface and perhaps some amorphous calcium phosphate being located uh, at the implant interface itself. And this again was confirmed by um, Adam Hitchcock looking at some of the structure and showing that there's a different uh, calcium 2P um, edge that we see far away from the implant and, and then at the interface. Um, and he was also able to show for us that we do see a large amount of the titanium oxide a few microns away from the implant interface. So we're really interested in, in studying that in more detail, especially looking at drug eluding surfaces and trying to understand um, if the components on the surface of an implant leach into the bone structure. So I hope I showed you that there's a way that we can combine a number of complicated three-dimensional and four-dimensional imaging tools to understand something about how bone integrates with implants. And in this case, we looked at this uh, microscale structure of an implant uh, placed in, in bone, and we can evaluate bone implant contact. But then moving to the nanoscale, we can use electron tomography to look at collagen arrangement near an implant surface. And then taking this one step further to eels tomography and atom probe tomography, we're able to see that we have an afibrillar zone at the implant interface and identify you know, what the, the makeup is of that zone and so that we really have an atomic continuum. And so that if we have a nanostructured surface, a nanostructured titanium oxide interface, we have uh, bone bonding into this uh, atomic structure. And so now that we have this workflow, we're applying it to study other material systems, some surfaces with uh, nanotubes, for example, on the surface where we're interested in seeing how bone grows into these nanotubes. Okay, 
So that's what we've done on, on bone implant interfaces. And that's historically where my research group has been focused. But as we were working in this area, we became more and more interested in probing just the natural structure of bone tissue itself. Uh, in order for us to probe what it looks like at an implant interface, we want to know what the standard healthy status is of bone. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to understand how mineral and collagen interplay with one another and, and are arranged. So we've collaborated with um, other researchers at McMaster on this, Henry Schwartz, and then we've been working with the CCEM and uh, Brian Langelier there has been helping us with atom probe tomography uh, to look at the structure of bone at really small length scales. And you might think this is a, a problem that's solved. Don't people know how bone is, is structured and arranged? But in fact, there's three very different models for how collagen and mineral uh, are arranged with respect to one another. Interestingly, they're all done using electron tomography, so I, I quite like that. Uh, in this first model that came out uh, by Landis, there's collagen fibrils and the hydroxyapatite crystals are shown to nucleate within gaps between these um, collagen fibrils and then spread outwards. In the model uh, from Henry Schwartz, which was done with Beth McNally and John Luigi Baton, also in material science and engineering here at McMaster, they showed uh, that the mineral was likely in the form of plates wrapping around the collagen fibrils. And then even a few years ago, a new study came out showing different shaped crystals and, and uh, these crystals uh, cross many collagen fibrils. So I think these are all useful studies to show the three-dimensional or potential three-dimensional structure of bone, but they're all missing one thing and, and that's chemistry. So we really asked ourselves how we could uh, try to understand bone structure using some of the tools we have. And we wanted to see if atom probe tomography could help contribute to this understanding of collagen mineral arrangement. So we started first by performing this on, on some human bone from the jaw, which is unorganized human bone. Using TM imaging, we can see mineral crystals in these bright regions. And doing correlative atom probe tomography, we can map where uh, these calcium signals are corresponding to the bright um, mineral locations. When we look at larger samples and we look down different orientations, what we begin to see are similar things to what we've shown um, with Henry Schwartz in bone structure. So if we're looking down some of these axes in, inside the bone structure from atom probe tomography, we see circular calcium rich signals, which really map matches well to these images of bone tissue where we see these uh, hydroxyapatite plates forming circles. And these are surrounding a carbon rich or perhaps a collagen rich center. Um, so we wanted to uh, use this tool to explore in, in three dimensions, the different chemistries of bone. And with atom probe tomography, we can look in different orientations and we can make some observations. So one of the things that we did is we looked at co-localization of um, carbon and sodium to look at the potential location of proteins. We also looked across interfaces between mineral and collagen. And when we do that, we noticed that there are peaks of sodium at interfaces um, showing the role uh, of proteins in templating the, the growth of mineral uh, next to collagen fibrils. Um, but one of the real big drawbacks with this technique is we didn't know the orientation of our bone sample itself. We had no prior knowledge on this. Uh, so we wanted to do further studies where we knew the orientation of bone. And in fact, if you take a long bone, something like a femur or a tibia, uh, and you slice it in different directions, you have very different resulting bone structures. So we used this knowledge to create a sample for atom probe tomography in which we knew the orientation of collagen ahead of time. So this is some of the work that my PhD student, Brian Lee, uh, was working on, and he created these samples for atom probe tomography, which we first did electron tomography on, where we can know ahead of time the orientation of collagen is along the length of this sample. And then we perform atom probe tomography and look at the resultant uh, structure in 3D. So when we do this, we receive a three-dimensional map of our calcium, or I'm just showing two of the elements to make it simple. We can look at our calcium and our carbon signals. So our carbon representing our collagen fibrils, and we can see these long fibrils twisting throughout our structure, and we can overlay onto it our calcium map on top. And what's really interesting about atom probe tomography, and one of the things I find really attractive about it, is that you can select smaller regions of your data set to 
probe in more detail. So for example, we could say we're really interested in pulling out this collagen fibril and looking at it a little bit closer. And when we do that, we can extract this collagen fibril and we can look at the ways in which calcium um, representing our, our mineral inter interacts with this collagen. And we can see just from these two dimensional image or three dimensional images that it appears that there's a significant amount of the calcium surrounding the collagen fibril. There's other ways we can show this data. So these are some heat maps showing uh, in bright red here. This would be where the collagen fibrils are laying and uh, down below here where the calcium or the mineral is associated. And we know that in vitro systems are, are really well studied. So some others have done a lot of work on isolated collagen fibrils to look at how collagen mineralizes. And these systems are easy to take a look at one single collagen fibril because it, it's grown on a lab bench and you can place it in the microscope and view that individual fibril. Um, but the drawback with some of these in vitro systems is that they're, of course, not mineralized in the body. So what we're replicating on a lab bench isn't necessarily what is happening inside of our bodies. So we want to have a, a way that we can probe individual collagen fibrils that have mineralized in vivo. And I think atom probe tomography is one of those ways. We can now you know, select an individual collagen fibril and we can perform some analyses on this in great detail. So if we take this one individual collagen fibril, which we know is mineralized inside an animal and not on a lab bench, we can look at the organization of where calcium and phosphorus are with respect to carbon and nitrogen, which represent our collagen fibril. And so what we can see is that we have a large amount of the mineral exterior, exterior to the um, collagen fibril, but we do have some mineral inside of the fibril at discrete um, positions. And so this is showing us that we uh, really have a combination of some of the models that have already existed with, with a preference for there being a majority of the collagen or sorry, the mineral exterior to the fibril, like the model by uh, McNally and Schwartz. And we can even probe the, uh, the type of mineral in these different locations because we have not just you know, the, the three dimensional structure, but the chemistry. So if we take a look at mineral inside and outside of the collagen fibril. These two graphs show um, different types of, or different locations of mineral. And we compare calcium to phosphorus. We find that there's in fact different calcium to phosphorus ratios, uh, depending on where you are with respect to the collagen fibril. So inside of the fibril, uh, we have a calcium and phosphorus ratio that's similar to amorphous calcium phosphate. And outside of it, we have a ratio that's similar to crystalline hydroxyapatite. Uh, so it's possible that we can use atom probe tomography to not only show where the mineral is, but to probe the exact type of mineral we have with respect to a collagen fibril. So are we there yet? May, I think there's still more work for us to do. I think atom probe tomography is starting to move towards a solution because it's giving us this interactive model that we can probe and we can start looking at you know, the location of mineral with respect to a collagen fibril. And uh, I'm excited for us to continue doing this work and looking at different bone systems and looking at uh, healthy and diseased bone to try to understand uh, the mineral collagen arrangement in, in different types of bones. Uh, but I think it's definitely opening uh, the doors uh, for us to a few answers that we didn't have previously. Okay, so we've looked at bone implants, then we've zoomed into the smallest length scale of bone structure, collagen, and mineral. Now I want to zoom out a little bit and take a look at uh, larger uh, structures within bone tissue. And we're really interested in looking at the mesoscale. And, and this came about because we were fortunate to have a new type of instrument at the CCEM. We had a plasma focused ion beam arrive a few years ago. And so we've been utilizing this in our research to look at the structure of human bone. And so we've seen a few things in this talk. We've seen bone at small length scales. So if we take a look at you know, the smallest length scale of bone, hydroxyapatite crystals and collagen fibrils, electron tomography is a great tool for probing this. So we can see in high resolution mineral and collagen. But one of the drawbacks of it is it's a small volume that we're accessing. These samples are extremely thin, as you can see in this video, less than 100 nanometers. So we're missing some of the large volume information. We can perform this on demineralized or mineralized tissue. So that's, that's great. 
Um, if we want to move to larger length scales, we can use another tool. We can use focused ion beam tomography. So this is an example shown from work by Reznikov et al. using gallium focused ion beam tomography. And in this sample, one of the drawbacks is that these are demineralized samples of bones. The, the mineral is gone. We just have the collagen remaining. But we have the advantage that we have larger volumes accessible, you know, 10 to 20 microns. And, uh, and a quite good resolution, not perhaps as good as TM, but still quite, quite good. So in order to see something larger, the mesoscale, we're interested in probing you know, all the way from the nanometer scale, having nanometer resolution, but over large volumes. So capturing you know, parts or full osteons and all of the cell network. And in order to do this, we're able to use plasma-focused ion beam, which uses a different source for milling materials. So this gives us the same resolution as conventional FibSem, a much larger volume, and the advantage of being able to look at different types of bone tissue. So what are we doing when we're doing um, tomography with FibSem or plasma FibSem tomography? Um, we're using our xenon ion beam to mill away material and an electron beam to capture an image. And then we repeat this sequentially. So we would mill another uh, layer of material away and capture an, another image of the surface. And by doing this sequentially milling and imaging, we can then group together all of the images that have been taken to create a uh, three-dimensional volume. And one of the big advantages of plasma fib tomography is that the volumes accessible are much, much larger than what's been previously shown with gallium focused ion beam. So we were excited to try this for the first time on bone tissue. And what does it mean when we're looking at bones? Well, it means that instead of looking at just part of a cell and, and a few extensions, if we're looking at fib, P, plasma fib or PFib tomography, we can perhaps have two cells within our volume, more cells connecting and interacting with another and have a much larger volume and be able to understand some of the biology. So we performed this in our lab on both mineralized and demineralized bone tissue. And most of the work on uh, FIB tomography has always been performed on, on demineralized tissue in the past. So we'll start there and I'll show you what we were able to see. This is one of the tomograms we've collected. And within it, you'll see a cell within our bone tissue starting to show up. And these bright white circles are representing areas where we have canaliculi or our, our bone cell networks, the extensions from our bone cells throughout the whole volume. And what we can do is reconstruct this into three dimensions. And we're able to see that we have uh, uh, this part of a cell here, we actually have another cell over here and we can see the junction between the two cells, the connections between them um, with quite high resolution. And what we're able to approach now is something on the length scale of what could be achieved at the synchrotron uh, with nano CT, but now we're able to do this with, with a lab-based or university-based uh, imaging system rather than a synchrotron. Other things we can do with this data is we can extract out organelles within the cells. So this wasn't our intent, but we were able to see some of the features inside the cell when we did this tomography. We can also take measurements from this data. So now we don't have just two dimensional uh, images. We have 3D volumes where we can take measurements of features such as the canaliculi, and we can look at their, their length, at their diameter, and we can understand their distribution in a three dimensional volume, which has been very valuable. Um, so we can do this on demineralized tissue, as I showed, but what had never been done before was leaving the mineral in place inside the tissue and looking at mineralized tissue. And when we did this, we saw something quite remarkable. We saw a very different looking structure. You can see in these images, we have a really strong contrast. We have bright white regions and we have black places uh, showing a darker contrast. And we have uh, a part of a cell shown on the bottom here. And when we look in different orientations, we begin to see different structural features. Um, and I'll show you a video of the data set looking in this orientation here. What we have is the XZ plane, which is perpendicular to the long axis of, of the femur that we looked at. And I'll show you this video slicing through um, all of, of these levels. And what we saw was really interesting. We saw these circular type features that we had not quite noticed in such detail across bone before. 
uh, you'll see these black things that look like worms moving through the structure. These are the openings for cell networks and cell processes for the canaliculi. Um, and we were really intrigued by these circular features and, and wanted to know more about them. We had in fact seen them once before. So in some of the STEM imaging that we had done with Henry Schwartz's group, we saw a few of these circular features with TEM. And uh, what we determined is that these features, by looking in the FIB-SEM, we found they're, they're in fact everywhere. And nobody had noticed that they were everywhere in bone before. And so looking at these features, we can see that we have uh, a cross section of a circular feature, a rosette, but with TEM imaging, of course, we only had two dimensions, but with PFIB tomography, we now have a three-dimensional structure. So what we did is we took these um, features and we segmented them out in three dimensions. And this is the work of my students, uh, Dakota Binkley and Joe Deering. And what they did was looked at these uh, structures in 3D and now we're able to see their shape. And what we found is that they're actually these ellipsoidal uh, features. And when we're looking at the cross section, we see these circular features, but in the perpendicular direction, we can see an ellipse. So what we were able to show is that the bone mineral actually forms into these mineral ellipsoids about one micron wide and one to two microns long in humans. And when we look at them in different orientations in our TEM images, we see circular features, which we termed with, with Henry Schwartz as rosettes. And in the orthogonal direction, we see elliptical motifs. And so this was something quite exciting because we hadn't noticed this in human bone before. Around the same time that our work came out, uh, there were other evidence of these you know, ellipsoidal structures in bone in cranial sutures of, uh, of rats. Our collaborators in Sweden showed that in fact, these crane or these ellipsoidal structures change with time and or not with time but with distance from the cranial suture which represents time and the way the bone grows and so it's perhaps that these represent a transient phase um, and then the colleagues at McGill University the group of Mark McKee and Natalie Reznikov they showed the presence of these ellipsoids at the same time at the interface of or sorry the mineralization front in both wild type and hyperphosphatemia mice and show disorganization with the disease so normal ellipsoid structures in wild type animals and disordered structures in diseased animals so we're really excited about um, these structures these ellipsoids and that perhaps they in fact represent a new level of mineral hierarchy and bone uh, that hasn't been noticed on on such a large scale before which has been enabled by plasma fib so of course, during the pandemic, we had to pivot our work a little bit. And so this is a review paper that's recently come out from my student Kiara. And we revisited a lot of the TEM images we had of bone over the past you know, 15 years or so and the work of other researchers as well. And in fact, we found that we had evidence of these mineral clusters in many different places at interfaces with hydroxyapatite scaffolds, bioglass, titanium implants. And we can really see that these were you know, a, a previously overlooked hierarchical feature of bone. And so we're really interested in our future work, focusing on these structures and looking at the impact that they have on, um, on bone formation or, or, you know, are they a transient phase? Are they always there? How do they vary from animal to animal? And how do they form? We're really interested in using our correlative tools to probe this in the future. So with that, I, I think I wanna end, end the talk for today. The first study I showed you how we're using a number of correlative tools from electron tomography to atom probe tomography to look at bone implant interfaces and to really show that there's a nanoscale continuum between the bone material and the implant. Uh, then using similar atom probe tomography techniques, we find a way that we can probe the composition of the collagen and mineral arrangement in bone and shed some light on uh, some of the models that are existing. And then using larger scale imaging techniques, we've identified this new ellipsoidal structure of mineral um, and showing that there's yet another level of hierarchy within bone tissue um, that would be interesting for us to probe and understand in the future so we can develop materials that mimic these natural structures within bone. 
Uh, and to end, I really need to acknowledge the people doing this work. Unfortunately, this image is two years old now, so we don't have a new lab image that's on our list for this summer. Um, but some of the students who've participated in the work featured in this particular presentation are highlighted here. And uh, our collaborators, of course, people from McMaster, France, Sweden, um, and lastly, uh, we couldn't have done any of this work without the support of the Canadian Centre for Electron Microscopy and their fantastic technical staff there, some of whom are listed here for, for the specific work shown in today's presentation. So thank you all uh, for your time, and I'd be really happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was, that was really amazing. Uh, such incredible images and renderings that you have there. Um, really beautiful. Thank you. So we have time for questions from the audience. Feel free to raise your hand um, and or come on video and, um, and unmute yourself if you like. I'll start by asking about the, the bone implant interface. So you mentioned that future work on looking at, um, let's say, drug-eluting coatings and things like that. Um, and I'm, that sounds really interesting. And I'm wondering, with the techniques that you're using, would there be certain types of sample preparation that are needed? So let's say, I guess, depending on what types of drugs are being coated on these types of implants and whatnot, um, but it, would there be certain um, molecules and such that, that may or may not be possible in the way that you're doing this and the techniques and, and yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've you've touched on a few really important uh, details. So sample preparation is, is a huge challenge. Um, I think one thing we have to bear in mind all the time is that we're taking a natural tissue and we're drying it out. So we're of course imparting some changes to the structure and the same thing would, would happen if we had a drug eluding coating, we'd be making some alterations to that structure. Um, but the techniques themselves are limited in the way uh, that the, the imaging is performed and that if we have a drug that's quite a light material, uh, it's not easy to detect. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to be able to couple those drug molecules with something heavier if we want to look at them in electron microscopy. Um, what we're hoping we can do in the future is use atom probe tomography to look at some of these details. There's beginning to be some work where people are looking at the structure of light materials like proteins. Um, and if we could use this as a, you know, a really uh, precise spectroscopy tool for drugs in the future, that would be fantastic. But the technology isn't there yet. Maybe if I give a talk 15 years from now, we can, we can show something like that. And just quickly to follow up, so those heavier elements, are some people starting to try to do that? And what sort of elements are used mm -hmm. to be able yeah. to? Yeah, I think the, the one that's used the most frequently now is, is strontium. So strontium has a, a dual um, function. It's used to slow down the process of osteoclasts, which are cells which remove bone. So it's it's used as a drug treatment for some um, types of osteoporosis. Um, so it's a drug treatment, but it's also a heavy material. So that is one of the things that we could see if we load inside an implant interface and uh, put it inside bone tissue. That can be measured and some other groups have shown this with some preliminary work with atom probe tomography, looking at the location of strontium. And, and I know their forthcoming work is showing uh, how strontium leaches in, into bone as well. Okay, very interesting. Thanks. I see that um, Alex has a question. Thanks very much. I'll, uh, I'll echo what Kyla said. Uh, this is really beautiful work uh, and amazing images of bone and, and the structure of bone that uh, is really shedding new light on uh, these structures. My question was more around um, how different different bones are in their structure. So you showed what I think when you when you talked about um, and you showed those beautiful images of the, the collagen fibers uh, mineralized, surrounded by the mineral. Uh, and I think you that was a femur, a bone from a femur. Is that right? Um, mm, that's or, correct. Or tissue yeah. from a femur. Um, so that's a, a bone that, that takes a lot of load, I guess. And mm -hmm. I, I, my question is, so if you look at a bone from a different part of the body, uh, is the structure similar or is it very different? Do we know how different the structure is of different bones? 
Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And it really does come back to, to loading. I think we could say bone is one of the first smart materials that, that was created. So it's, it responds to loading and changes its structure based on, on loads. So if we have a long bone, we know the orientation of collagen is along the length of that bone to provide the maximum strength uh, to withstand the, the loading forces. It, forces. If we look at a different bone that's not under as much loading or is under, um, you know, equal loads in, in different directions, it doesn't have as much of this defined orientation. But we see similar types of features. So we know that the constituents are the same. We have collagen fibrils and we have hydro hydroxyapatite crystals um, and we would have osteons in the bone as well. But the way in which they're oriented wouldn't be the same in all types of bones. One thing that we're really missing, and because these, these techniques are quite uh, time intensive, you know, nobody's looked at every single bone in the body. And in fact, many bones haven't even been imaged at this length scale. The community tends to focus on bones from, from long bones, uh, from the hip, um, because of hip fractures, from the spine. Uh, the ver vertebrae are really interesting bones and have very different structures. Um, and, uh, and bone in the maxilla and mandible uh, for dental implants. But there's a whole number of, of places that we haven't just had the chance to probe yet. Okay, yeah, that's, that's what I figured. It's it's really interesting. So there's still a lot of space for, for exploration. Thanks for Yeah, much. absolutely. It'll keep me busy for the rest of my career, hopefully. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Jose, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, congratulations, Catherine. Beautiful work, uh, amazing images. Thank uh, you. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the ellipsoids, which are, I guess, yeah. the newest uh, area of work and whether there's anything in the literature that you know that is nucleating those shapes and that's leading to that particular shape from the biological side. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that, you know, the, the hypothesis is out there that these are forming from, from an earlier structure, something called, well, something that has many names, calcospherulites is one of them, um, mineral foci is another one, uh, the McKee group at uh, McGill University uh, has looked at these in bone structure. Um, so there's the hypothesis that an initial uh, spherical or small nanoparticle cluster of bone mineral forms. Um, there's different theories on this, whether this forms from a vesicle or not, uh, that's still debated. Um, and then the idea is that these small sphere-like sphere structures would then grow into these ellipsoidal shapes. The challenge that we really have is that we're not able to view at this resolution over the life of an individual or, or an animal. So we can't see the exact evolution in real time the best we could do is sample at, at different time points what's happening. So I think some of the studies that need to follow are ones where we look at bone, which we know is under different phases of, of growth and remodeling. So perhaps looking at um, you know, different model systems, a lot of work is done in uh, turkey tendon. So that's one example where bone structure can be looked at. There's lots of work looking at mineralization fronts. So where we can identify new places of bone growth. And we think even the bone implant interface would be an interesting zone to look at. And uh, we have some work coming out of our lab that uh, Joe Deering, one of my PhD students will hopefully be showing soon, uh, where we can actually see at the mineralization front of an implant, these ellipsoidal structures and, and look at their change over you know, discrete time points. But I wish we could do these techniques uh, on, on living tissue and we would really answer a lot more questions. And so if I may follow up, um, are these maybe some structures that can be targeted as sort of, you know, grown in lab, um, precursors to bone replacement materials. Yeah, yeah, this is an excellent idea because I think this structure has been has been missed. So when people are creating bone replacements now, they're really aiming towards mimicking the exact structure of bone or at least the composition and the same mechanical properties. Uh, but if we're missing one of these hierarchical details, this ellipsoidal structure, we might not be able to create a, a perfect replacement. So I think looking at composite materials which incorporate ellipsoidal ceramic particles, for example, would be really interesting to see if, if their uptake is, is better within the body. 
Thank you. Something for us to work on. <laughs> <laughs> other questions? I have a couple other too. Alex, go ahead first. Sure, thanks. Um, just one other quick question, I think. So when you showed the um, sort of bone um, implant interface, uh, you mentioned that there were collagen striations that you see in, in the uh, in the bone, but when you get close to the implant, they were, they kind of disappear, right, if I understood correctly. Is that understood why that, that's the case? Is that just because the bone hasn't formed perfectly there, or is it a, a different type of bone that's forming at the at that interface? Yeah, that's a great question. So, when bone is depositing on on the interface, it's it's not the first thing that's that's touching the implant. And Kyla is an expert in this, so proteins are the first thing that that are interacting with the implant surface. So, the first uh, layer that we have down are, are proteins, and then one of the things that's thought that happens with certain types of biomaterials is that there's uh, a precipitation of mineral like hydroxyapatite just from the, the blood and this, the extracellular matrix contacting the, the implant. So we think that there might be you know, natural bone tissue, which includes both hydroxyapatite and collagen, and then a layer in between, which doesn't have collagen fibrils, but might just be uh, you know, the mineral phase of bone that's been uh, precipitated out in, in solution. And so what we show with our analysis, especially, you know, some of the eel spectroscopy that we did, we think that this phase is an amorphous calcium phase at the exact implant interface, and it's not a crystalline phase of, of the mineral. Um, whether this would change with time, it probably would. Um, the the bone tissue itself is remodeling all the time. So it's removing itself and it's replacing itself. So if we were to look at a different implant interface, we might see a slightly different zone um, of attachment based on, on the age of the bone implant interface. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Do have a chance for any others, but I know one of my questions I can save till later. Um, but the, with the images, so, so the one question is about APT, so I'll, I'll remember to ask you that later. Uh, but the, the one um, 3D rendering where you showed the, the cells and the organelles inside, which seems pretty incredible. <laughs> what kind of cells are those? And, and would you be seeing like multiple different types of cells and are there ways you can distinguish this in these, in these images? Yeah. This is great. You guys have all, all the excellent questions for the, our future work. So one of the things uh, uh, we can, we know that this one, this cell we, we saw is an osteocyte. So this cell is responsible for mechanical signaling and transduction within bone, um, maintaining uh, the structure of bone. Um, there's other cells that we could have. So we could have osteoblasts when bone is depositing itself. These are the building cells. Um, we could have osteoclasts when bone is repairing itself. So there's these three main types. Um, what would be ideal to do to identify which type of cell we have? I mean, osteocytes are quite easy. They have a unique morphology, so we know which those are. Um, but of course, we're looking at small volumes in the in the electron microscope. We can't just go hunting around, uh, you know, through through our structure. So if we could do correlative. Uh, fluorescence microscopy and electron microscopy. This would be the way we could identify our cell types. So we could look for, if we're looking for where new bone is forming, so for perhaps where these mineral ellipsoids are forming, we could look for staining for osteoblasts, try to find our osteoblasts with optical fluorescence microscopy, and then take uh, those defined regions into the electron microscope and look at uh, more detail with the, with the electron microscope in those zones. But there's lots of things that have to be worked out on, on the workflow staining for confocal and for fluorescence microscopy, and then different types of embedding for electron microscopy. Uh, so lots of lots of work to be able to enable that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, great work and great presentation. Really appreciate you sharing this with, with the BIMR community. Thanks so much. And thanks for the invitation today. It's my, my pleasure and my honor to present with uh, the BIMR. So I'll, I'll allow everyone to give a virtual round of applause. And thanks again for a great series of seminars and, and for um, the director, Alex Adrenov, for organizing all of this and getting us together 
yeah, virtually <laughs> for this case. And we look forward to a future when we can all get together in person. Again, I'm sure everyone will agree. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Catherine and, and everyone who attended. And uh, I do look forward to having these seminars in person uh, starting next year.